Part one, Amarok the Wolf. My ax pushed back the hood of her seal skin parka and looked at the Arctic sun. It was a yellow disc in a lime green sky, the colors of six o'clock in the evening and the time when the wolves awoke. Quietly, she put down her cooking pot and crept to the top of a dome-shaped frost heave, one of the many earth buckles that rise and fall in the crackling cold of the Arctic winter. Lying on her stomach, she looked across a vast lawn of grass and moss and focused her attention on the wolves she had come upon two sleeps ago. They were wagging their tails as they awoke and saw each other. Her hands trembled and her heartbeat quickened for she was frightened, but not so much of the wolves who were shy and many harpoon shots away, but because of her desperate predicament, Myax was lost. She had been lost without food for many sleeps on the north slope of Alaska. The barren slope stretches for 200 miles from the Brooks Range to the Arctic Ocean, and for more than 800 miles from Canada to the Chukchi Sea. No roads cross it, ponds and lakes freckle its immensity, winds scream across it, and the view in every direction is exactly the same. Somewhere in this cosmos was Myax, and the very life in her body, its spark and warmth, depended upon these wolves for survival, and she was not so sure they would help. Myax stared hard at the regal black wolf, hoping to catch his eye. She must somehow tell him that she was starving and ask him for food. This could be done, she knew, for her father, an Eskimo hunter, had done so. One year he had camped near a wolf den while on hunt. When a month had passed and her father had seen no game, he told the leader of the wolves that he was hungry and needed food. The next night the wolf called him from afar, from far away, and her father went to him and found a freshly killed caribou. Unfortunately, Myax's father never explained to her how he had told the wolf of his needs. And not long afterward, he paddled his kayak into the Bering Sea to hunt for seal, and he never returned. She had been watching the wolves for two days, trying to discern which of their sounds and movements expressed goodwill and friendship. Most animals had such signals. The little Arctic ground squirrels flick, flicked their tails sideways to notify others of their kind that they were friendly. By imitating their, this signal with her forefinger, Myax had lured many a squirrel to her hand. If she could discover such a gesture for the wolves, she would be able to make friends with them and share their food like a bird or a fox. Propped on her elbows with her chin in her fists, she stared at the black wolf, trying to catch his eye. She had chosen him because he was much larger than the others and because he walked like her father, Capuchin, with his head high and his chest out. The black wolf also possessed wisdom. She had observed. The pack looked to him when the wind carried strange scents or the birds cried nervously. If he was alarmed, they were alarmed. If he was calm, they were calm. Long minutes passed and the black wolf did not look at her. He had ignored her since the first came upon them two sleeps ago, since she first came upon them two sleeps ago. True, she moved slowly and quietly so as not to alarm him. Yet she did wish he would see the kindness in, in her eyes. Many animals could tell the difference between hostile hunters and friendly people by merely looking at them but the big black wolf would not even glance at her. A bird stretched in the grass. The wolf looked at it. A flower twisted in the wind. He glanced at that. Then the breeze rippled the wolverine ruff on Myax's parka and it glistened in the light. He did not look at that. She waited. Patience with the ways of nature had been instilled in her by her father. And so she knew better than to move or shout. Yet she must get food or die. 
Her hands shook slightly and she swallowed hard to keep calm. Mayax was a classic Eskimo beauty, small of bone and delicately wired with strong muscles. Her face was pearl round and her nose was flat. Her black eyes, which slanted gracefully, were moist and sparkling, like the beautifully formed polar bears and foxes of the north. She was slightly short-limbed. The frigid environment of the Arctic was sculptured life into compact shape. Unlike the long-limbed, long-bodied animals of the south that are cooled by dispensing heat on extended surfaces, all live things in the Arctic tend toward compactness to conserve heat. The length of her limbs and the beauty of her face were of no use to Mayax as she lay on the lichen speckled frost heave in the midst of the bleak tundra. Her stomach ached and the royal black wolf carefully ignoring her. Amarok, Elaya, wolf. My friend, she finally called, look at me, look at me. She spoke half in Eskimo and half in English, as if the instincts of her father and the science of the Gusaks, the white-faced, might evoke some magical combination that would help her get her message through to the wolf. Amarok glanced at his paw and slowly turned his head her way without lifting his eyes. He licked his shoulder. A few matted hairs sprang apart and twinkled individually. Then his eyes sped to each of the three adult wolves that made up his pack, and finally to the five pups who were sleeping in a fuzzy mass near the den entrance. The gray wolf's eyes softened at the sight of the little wolves, then quickly hardened into brittle yellow jewels as he scanned the flat tundra. Not a tree grew anywhere to break the monotony of the gold green plain, for the soils of the tundra are permanently frozen. Only moss, grass, lichens, and a few hardy flowers take root in the thin upper layer that thaws briefly in summer. Nor do many species of animals live in this rigorous land, but those creatures that do dwell here exist in bountiful numbers. Amarok watched a large cloud of Lapland long spurs wheel up into the sky then a light in the grasses swarms of crane flies one of the few insects that sur that can survive the cold darkened the tips of the mosses birds wheeled turned and called thousands sprang up from the ground like leaves in a wind the wolf's ears cupped forward and tuned in on some distant message from the tundra Mayax tensed and listened too did he hear some brewing storm, some approaching enemy? Apparently not. His ears relaxed and he rolled to his side. She sighed, glanced at the vaulting sky and was painfully aware of her predicament. Here she was, watching wolves. She, Mayax, daughter of Kapujin, adopted child of Martha, citizen of the United States pupil at the Bureau of Indian Affairs School in Barrow, Alaska, and 13-year-old wife of the boy Daniel. She shivered at the thought of Daniel, for it was he who had driven her to this fate. She had run away from him exactly seven sleeps ago. And because of this, she had only one more title by Gusak standards, the child de Force. The wolf rolled to his belly, Amarok, she whispered, I am lost and the sun will not set for a month. There is no North Star to guide me. Amarok did not stir. And there are no berry bushes here to bend under the polar wind and point to the south. Nor are there any birds I can follow. She looked up. Here, the birds are buntings and long spurs. They do not fly to the sea twice a day like the puffins and sandpipers that my father followed. The wolf groomed his chest with his tongue. I never dreamed I could get lost, Amarok, she went on, talking out loud to ease his fear. At home on Nunivak Island where I was born, the plants and birds pointed the way for wanderers. 
I thought they did so everywhere. And so, great black Amarok, I'm without a compass. It had been a frightening moment when two days ago she realized that the tundra was an ocean of grass on which she was circling around and around. Now, as that fear overcame her again, she closed her eyes. When she opened them, her heart skipped excitedly. Amarok was looking at her. Eli, she called and scrambled to her feet. The wolf arched his neck and narrowed his eyes. He pressed his ears forward, she waved. He drew back his lips and showed his teeth. Frightened by what seemed a snarl, she lay down again. When she was flat on her stomach, Amarok flattened his ears and wagged his tail once. Then he tossed his head and looked away. Discouraged, she wriggled backward down the frost heave and arrived at her camp feet first. The heave was between herself and the wolf pack, and so she relaxed, stood up, and took stock of her home. It was a simple affair, for she had not been able to carry much when she ran away. She took just those things she would need for the journey. A backpack, food for a week or so, needles to mend clothes, matches, her sleeping skin, a ground cloth to go under it, two knives, and a pot. She had intended to walk to Point Hope. There she would meet the North Star, the ship that brings supplies from the States to the towns on the Arctic Ocean in August when the ice pack breaks up. The ship could always use dishwashers or laundresses, she had heard. And so she would work her way to San Francisco where, Aunt, where Amy, her pen pal, lived. At the end of every letter, Amy always wrote, when are you coming to San Francisco? Seven days ago, she had been on her way, on her way to the glittering white postcard city that sat on a hill among trees, those enormous plants she had never seen. She had been on her way to see the television and carpeting in Amy's school, the glass buildings, traffic lights, and stores full of fruits, on her way to the harbor that never froze and the Golden Gate Bridge. But primarily, she was on her way to be rid of Daniel, her terrifying husband. She kicked the sod at the thought of her marriage, then shaking her head to forget, she surveyed her camp. It was nice. Upon discovering the wolves, she had settled down to live near them in the hope of sharing their food until the sun set and the stars came out to guide her. She had built a house of sod like the summer ho homes of the old Eskimos. Each brick had been cut with her ulo, the half moon shaped woman's knife. So versatile, it can trim a baby's hair, slice a tough bear or chip an iceberg. Her house was not well built for she had never made one before, but it was cozy inside. She had windproofed it by stealing the sod bricks with mud from the pond at her door. She had made it beautiful by spreading her caribou ground cloth on the floor. On this, she had placed her sleeping skin, a moose hide bag lined with soft white rabbit skins. Next to her bed, she had built a low table of sod on which to put her clothes when she slept. To decorate the house, she had made three flowers of bird feathers and stuck them in the top of the table. Then she had built a fireplace outdoors and placed her pot beside. The pot was empty, for she had not found even a lemming to eat. Last winter, when she had walked to school in Barrow, these mice-like rodents were so numerous, they ran out from under her feet wherever she stepped. There were thousands and thousands of them until December, when they suddenly vanished. Her teacher said that the lemmings had a chemical similar to antifreeze in their blood that kept them active all winter when other little mammals were hibernating. They eat grass and multiply all winter, Mrs. Franklin had said in her sing-song voice. When there are too many, they grow nervous at the sight of each other. Somehow, this shoots too much antifreeze into their bloodstreams and it begins to poison them. They become restless, then crazy. They run in a frenzy until they die. Of this phenomenon, Myax's father had simply said, 
The hour of the lemming is over for four years.